Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, How to Increase Profits While Cutting Risk with Commodity Spreads. I'm Kevin Falk, and I'm a product, product specialist here at CQG, and I do cover our CQG spreader product. And today our guest speaker is Michael Martin. Welcome, Mike. Hey, thanks for having me, Kev. And we're pleased to have Michael today for our webinar. Michael uh, Martin has been a successful trader for over 20 years. Uh, he's been teaching classes through UCLA Extension and the New York Society of Security Analysts for 12 years. Michael's worked on Wall Street, trading commodity accounts, as well as starting his own proprietary trading operation. After moving to Los Angeles from Manhattan, Michael started his own CTA and also began a teaching and mentoring program for students who wanted personalized instruction on what a trading, um, you know, trading techniques are best suited for them. Michael is also the author of the Inner Voice of Trading book and mentoring program. I'm very pleased to be introducing Michael Martin for today's presentation. And with that, Michael, I'm going to pass it off to you. Thanks very much, Kevin. That's great. I appreciate your, uh, you and CQG having me today. For those of you listening, this is the second, really, of uh, two spread presentations that we've done. The first one is available in the CQG library where we kind of covered some of the basics, and I'll, I'll touch on them just a little bit for those of you who didn't uh, participate in that webinar, but it's free to, to see and to watch and hear and listen to um, at CQG. I probably don't have to tell you this, but for those of you that are already in spreads or actively looking to do spreads, CQG is kind of the place to be, and it always has been, really. I've used a couple of different data platforms for one way or one reason or another. Sometimes I had to, but when you're looking at spread efficacy and the charting capabilities and what you're looking to do in terms of seeing these relationships, these relative values, right, CQG is a fantastically clean uh, platform to see all that. So I kind of just go, you know, they asked Rod Carew one year how he hit 410, and he said, well, I hit them where they ain't. And I just like doing things that are very easy because trading is hard enough. You know, over the course of today, in no particular order, I'm going to hit upon three bullets at any given time as we progress through the slides. So this isn't like I'm not going to read the bullets. Uh, which you can get from any mutual fund wholesaler. That's not my style. I actually have talent, and I'm going to be doing this in a way that's going to convey wisdom for you so that you can kind of congregate, conjugate your own emotional constitution and how you're trading now and why aren't you looking at spreads because I think when you look at them and you see how they act and what they provide for you, you're going to have a tough time justifying to yourself why you haven't at least investigated uh these wonderful vehicles, these living and breathing organisms known as commodity spreads. And what's beautiful about them is that you can't really get them anywhere but in the commodities market. So it is kind of clubby that way. There are some things from a methodological and tactical standpoint that you're going to want to know. And you're certainly going to have to, again, be very, very aware of what the feeling tone is and what the pulse is from an emotional standpoint when you look at spreads because they behave differently than outright directional ideas. Um, and they can certainly give you an emotional response, uh, one that you might not be used to, um, one that might be severely geared down from what you might be used to. And that takes a while to get used to it emotionally. I think mathematically and structure-wise, you're going to understand how to put these things together uh, in terms of the why. But the why is the intellectual, and that's anywhere between 5 to 20% of it. The emotional response is what's compelling. So just to ease into it here, when you look at two commodities that you're going to play against one another, a spread is, by definition, your long one instrument and your short another of a different month. Now, that can be within one market like sugar or wheat, and that's referred to an intra, so within, right, intra commodity spread. And then you have one that we're going to look at here, a gasoline versus heat and oil. And that is a very closely related but still yet um, different, two different commodities, and we call that an inter, you know, between two different commodities, an inter-commodity spread. And we can also vary the months, but I typically like to keep it nice and clean and use the same months for these types of trades. We'll look at that going forward as well. Another thing is that you're hedged in that, you know, when you're long and short, two highly correlated instruments, 
uh, they typically move in, in tandem. So you do have a bit of a built-in mistake if you look at them independently, right? Because one's going to go up. Hopefully your long will outperform your short, uh, but you will have one of the legs that loses. The idea, though, is that having both legs on, as they're called, both two different contracts, those are referred to the legs, uh, gives you time. So you can have a bit of a, I don't want to call it buy and hold, but you certainly can take it home with you, which means, you know, I don't know why anyone would trade commodities and, and, and unwind the position at the end of the day. I don't know why you'd even put a position on to begin with if you weren't planning on holding it because you're not letting the market work for you. You're not letting the leverage come into play. And so you're kind of castrating yourself before you even really get into the game. Um, yes, these do have a biological cl conclusion in terms of expiration when they go off the board. Uh, so you do have to do something with them, usually uh, certainly to the long leg, you know, before first notice. Uh, so you don't get <laughs> delivered against and that's happened to me once or twice. I can tell you about it offline. But because they're hedged, and because you don't have to worry about the market making a sharp move overnight or over the weekend or over, you know, Christmas, holiday, New Year's, Fourth of July, any times you have the three, four day weekends uh, where the markets aren't open, you don't have to be sweating the oldies with uh, what's his name and sleeping with one foot on the floor because, again, you're hedged and you're not necessarily playing either of the contracts independently, but yet the relationship between them. And that's where I think spreads can uh, play a part in a person's overall managed account platform or within your CTA, if that's so uh, how it works. Now, as you know, when you use the word trader, right, trader could mean 85 different things. It's the, it's the sales trader on the OTC desk for NASDAQ who's helping the institutional salespeople move inventory. It's the guy that I call in Chicago at the CTA desk who's just taking my orders, and it's also the same person who's in the ring, whatever's left of the ring. Um, you know, to, to get me fills and execution. Same with spreads. Spreads, there are inter and intra commodity spreads, but there's also a spread that's referred to kind of more analogous to the bid ask spread, and that's referred to um, in the calendar strip, as I call it. You know, you might see it as a market minder, or, um, you know, every platform is a little bit different, but it's one by which you see all of the expiration months going out for as long as possible, you know, so natural gas, you'll see upwards of 20 years of, uh, you know, potential expirations, you know, and same thing with some of the other commodities, you can see many, many, many months out. And so when you look at them concurrently, you can see what we call the calendar strip. Um, here are some examples of uh, intra commodity spreads, you know, people trade the crop year, as it's called, uh, or sometimes they trade seasonality in um, energy markets, you know, when the seasons change, because that's typically when you either go into storage or you're drawing from storage. And other intercommodity spreads like you see here, which effectively are trades in protein, you know, um, soybeans, wheat, corn, they all have a different percent protein content uh, within them by percent, um, by weight. Uh, not by volume. Of course, 5,000 bushels is a volume measurement, right? So it's not a weight measurement. And so when you're looking at what does a feedlotter need in terms of protein, pounds of protein to feed the cattle or the hogs to make weight, um, that becomes very important because of the correlation between protein and the body weight of the animals. And so feedlotters look at the protein cost so that their livestock can make weight. Uh, before they bring them to the market. And they're always looking for the best type of protein uh, by cost. What's the most cost-effective type of protein? Probably coming, you know, soybean meal has the highest content at about 44, 45% by weight in terms of protein, but it's also very expensive. So they try to make way, so to speak, no pun intended, with the other products yet you see relationships when one becomes cheaper relative to the other, it might be a good time to buy or sell the spread. Um, so let's take a look at some of these. Here, this is uh, gasoline. You're looking at the spread as the strip, as I call it, uh, RB, right, for RBOB. This is the third gasoline contract that's traded since its inception originally, I believe, in 1983. We went from your basic gasoline, then you went to a no lead, and now we're at this RBOB. Um, 
reformulated blend stock for oxygenated blending is what it stands for. Not that you're ever going to make any money knowing that you might impress people at the cocktail party. But nonetheless, this is a byproduct of crude oil. Um, as you boil and heat uh, uh, crude oil, it has byproducts and heating oil and gasoline are just two of them. And they also trade in the futures markets, and you can and you can study those relationships. They're called product spreads. You can do the same in the soybeans, known as the crush spread. So this is the crack spread. So let's look at gasoline. And what I want you to take a look at is, if you look at the S column, the third most from the right, you can kind of see the previous settlement. Um, and you can see that the prices typically get higher as you go down or go further out on the calendar. Uh, or you have, you know, in, in, in row number two, you've got, you know, um, January. Row number three, you've got February, March. You can tell by the month symbols that you have there, uh, which are probably no surprise to you all. And although there aren't uh, carry charges proper, albeit for the grains and the ag market, uh, excuse me, the softs, in terms of, you know, carrying charges, what you do have are storage costs. And those storage costs are in, 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 in um, what's the word I'm looking for, embedded in the price of the commodity. And typically, the longer that you have until potential delivery, the more storage you have, the more storage you have, obviously, the higher cost. So you can see that represented here by the S column and to some degree in the, in the uh, second column from the left in terms of last trade. Um, you will see the prices go higher. In other words, and what you can read into this is that the market is telling you right now that in terms of what we need right here, right now, there is ample, ample supply to meet our needs. In fact, there is so much ample supply for what we need. Our, we'll actually pay you more in the future. And you can see that. So in other words, delivering it sooner would actually be penalizing you. So the producer and the folks who are wholesaling this stuff try to find the cheapest way to store it because the market will pay them more money in the future for the supply that they have. Um, now, that is very different from the heat and oil market, what we call heat or fuel oil. It trades by a whole bunch of names. Ticker is HO, um, HOE in this regard. And, of course, you've got the month symbols. The number two represents 12, right, for calendar year. So the first one there is heat and oil for December of 2012. And then the next one is Jan January for 2013 next year. Now, in this case, you're looking at months, and you'll notice that as you go further out, the prices drop from 306 and a half, basically, all the way down to 301, way out in September in row 10. Now, that is an inverted market. Um, and whereby the, the current months and the front months are much higher than the deferred months. And this market is saying there is tightness, and it's probably obviously due to Hurricane Sandy and the delivery issues that they had at Henry Hub and in New York Harbor uh, because of the hurricane. Um, seasonally, we are in a heat and oil season as opposed to gasoline. Uh, most of the driving, the driving season is considered the summertime. And I'm probably saying stuff you already know. But nonetheless, you're looking at this uh, second column on the left, the last trade, and certainly the previous settlement, I believe, from the S yes column uh, towards the right. You can see that the prices go down. Those spreads, those differences between the months tell you that the market's tight. Supply is tight, and the market is saying, please give us everything that you have or as much as you have right here, right now, because we will pay a premium for it, and we will, in fact, penalize you for it. So, you know, for a hamburger today, I'll gladly pay you Tuesday as, a pace, as opposed to four months from now where, you know, out in uh, towards the end of the or, you know, the summertime, even in the in column or excuse me, row eight, you're looking at July, you're looking at just under three point, you know, three dollars, three, three dollars, three cents. So you want to start thinking about what that market is telling you from a spread month from one uh, from from a spread standpoint you know, month over month from the um, in terms of supply, because it's the supply or not that typically drives this market. Um, so again, in this case, because the market's inverted, storage is thereby penalized. Um, so you, a person who is in that business would want to bring it forward and sell it as much as they possibly could into these higher prices. Um, 
here we are looking at a trade that I'm actually in. I like to kind of, you know, show you a couple of things I do only because I think it's ethical and uh, obviously I have to disclose it. Um, but what I share with you about this might surprise you. As you know, for those of you who read my book, I didn't gloat on all the ways that I made lots of money. Um, one day I'll probably, you know, write that book up because I still have to trade confirmations. And my guess is your eyes will pop out of your head, you know, for the way that I trade um, because of the way I'm built emotionally. And here's a trade that I put on, I actually lost money on early on. I was very, very early. I'm, I'm making a little money now, nothing to write home about, but it's, non, it's nonetheless a very reliable spread. And of course, we're hedged. So this is a spread where you're, you're long March, you're short February natural gas. And let me see if I can work this correctly. Um, what you're looking at, you know, over here is the difference in the prices. And these are negative numbers, right? So February is greater than March because the difference is negative. And I put the trade on somewhere over here at this little stub right there in the middle at about three cents February. Um, and obviously I was very, very early because if you look at the sell-off, it's like, yahoo, holy cow. The, the thing you can take solace in is that, you know, each of these price movements, you know, say from here to here is only $100 per spread. So it looks much more drastic given the scale of the chart that we're here. But we're not, it's not like fantastic Brian Hunter, I just put Amaranth out of business kind of volatility. It's very, very small. Uh, you know, said another way, the distance from here to here is only $50 per, per spread. So, uh, you know, again, it's not, it's not as volatile as you might think. Um, so nonetheless, I was early, you know, getting in right over here at this little cell here. It's about 31 or 3.1 cents to the Feb. And what I suspect is that it can go as high as, you know, five cents to the March. So the spread and actually can invert. And that's an important thing to bring up in the world of spreading and how things like this work. So let me go back a little bit. When you're looking at gasoline, um, you can see that their storage costs are embedded in the prices. Well, somebody with a sharp pencil can figure out what the storage costs are. Of course, it varies geographically, and this is how Tim Arnold made a lot of money um, in natural gas you know, trading is actually he traded storage more than the underlying commodities themselves. Um, not Tim Arnold, what's his name? The guy from Centaurus. Tim Arnold is the guy from Trading Blocks. Anyway, um, you're looking at these costs. There is a maximum that you can get in terms of storage costs. In other words, what we call full carry. There's a calculable amount that the difference between this contract and this contract will have. There's a calculable difference. Well, let me pick this one and this one. When markets are trading, there is a maximum amount it can go to in terms of a carry, carry, uh, carry charge. But in, in, when you look at markets that invert, like here we go back to heat and oil, there is no premium that this contract can go over here. It can go up an unlimited amount. In fact, the February contract in heat and oil can go to four, and this can stay right where it is because um, of the way supply and demand works. And because the market's inverted, there is no, again, higher boundary in terms of how the spread can work from a differential standpoint. And that's an important thing to know. So you're hedged, coming back to the nat gas here, you're hedged uh, with two different contracts that are highly correlated. Um, but because you bought the March and you're looking at Feb, there is a maximum difference that you'll be able to get from one month to the next. And that is reflected in the storage costs. Um, that's an important thing to know. Also, at the end of the day, um, someone's asking a question here. Sold Feb, yes, bought March, right. You're buying March, you're selling Feb against it, you're creating the hedge that way. Um, and you're playing the difference in the prices. And you know the good news is that you get a, giant, a big, big haircut in the margin. Um, now, you wouldn't typically trade more spreads than you would the outrights. That's the rule of thumb. Um, 
you'd want to make sure that you, you are managing your risk and you know what percent of your overall capital. But because you're hedged, the great folks at the CN, they have a great, great calculator on how things work in terms of calculating the um, spread margins. Um, it's very easy to understand. I'm going to walk you through um, a couple of those just so you see because you know the exchanges. The exchanges first set the margins and then you perform your clearing member, your CM, wherever that goes, even if you're working through an IB, your your member firm, FCM, can make those margin rules more stringent. It can't make them more lack. and assume the market levels that the CME group choose and just adopt those as their own margin requirement, initial margin and maintenance margin, but it could also make them much more stringent. And, you know, depending on where you are and what their business model is, you may see that they want to you know, buy people away from certain commodities. I remember dealing with one FCM way, way back that their margin for platinum at the time, you know, 100% of additional value. You know, there wasn't even reg T margin, the thing, that, not that there could be, but they made it so prohibitively expensive, they were effectively saying to the market, we don't want platinum business here. Uh, because we're going to we're going to charge you 100% of the notional value which if you're not familiar with that language just basically means you know the the price of the futures contract multiplied by you know, 50 ounces which is the standardized size of you know the platinum contract itself so once they take the leverage out of the equation they really take away all the benefit of of trading the commodity futures contract itself um so, you know, here we have the natural gas, uh, which we just talked about. And it's important. Uh, I put this up not because I want to review yet again what calendar strip looked like, but this was settlement price from a day or two ago. And I just want you to take a look. Look at the volatility. Obviously, it was, it was down. So if you were a directional person, you're either very happy as a short or you were feeling here almost $900 in burn against your big daddy track, the 10,000 unit one, you know, terms of daily fluctuating, maybe that's a lot for you, maybe it's not. But when you go back on the same day and at the spread, you know, the spread moved, you know, tenths of a cent, which is 30 bucks. And you compare that to the market here, it's very interesting to look at the how the outright directional trade, you know, trade. And looking here between Feb and March, you can see the difference. There's your, your three tenths of one cent. And so how can this actually be performed given the market that's all over the place? Personally, and what I think about them, own behavior um, you know, is relevant, I know, only to me. But when I think of the energy markets, I think about the U.S. saying to Syria, no weapons of mass destruction. We've got Palestine now being able to come in and do some kind of observing at the United Nations. You've got Israel and Palestine chucking bombs in another now and iron dome. And you've got France and, and, and America. you have all these things going on in the energy complex, especially in and around crude oil. Trade directional stuff can be very challenging because it's a headline driven market, right? If you have headline driven markets, you can look at gold, the euro, the S&P 500 crude oil. I will share with you, call me stupid, I, I can count on hand how many times I've traded in those markets for the most for the last 10 years. Why? Because I don't need some amateur idiot on TV coming on TV talking about how everything can go up in smoke overnight. Typically, they don't have that interest in the game. They don't know what they're talking about. They're still looking for, you know, how the rebate they get when they sell something short in the future market, which is, you know, obviously a CFA style mentality. And and I just find that the market can have a lot, the amateur part of the market can have an impact in the short term uh, against one's equity. So I typically don't like to trade things that are in the headlines. I like that are more demure and off the beaten path and, and spread only really help that because it's not, you have to dig deep these relationships you know you have to do the footwork you don't just click us and hover it over a certain thing and click it and then all of a sudden you got your depth of market you know, what have you and it's you know so it's you can hit hidden gems here um, that work 
especially from a standpoint. That, that, well, you know, America, the global macro economy here in the United States, is going to turn on a dime. You know, when you look at these huge industries, whether it's beef and livestock, whether it's the sugar market, energies, um, you know, the market's not going to move for Boone Pickens. It's certainly not going to move for Mike Martin. So at the end of the day, you, you're you able to play these very, very reliable where you're hedged for lower margin and you can take it home with you at night. So the question is for you, and don't umbrage with this, I'm just saying it rhetorically, if you're sitting there trying to trade and P, A, I feel sorry for you. Two, I, I'm looking at trying to say, well, you're going to try to capture six to ten clicks on the uh, handles on the E, M, S, and P, and maybe your two to four or something like that. But why wouldn't you want to put on a speed your hedge where you can hold it? Let the market do the work. In day trading, any contract, as far as I'm concerned, you don't get for all that you put in one. Two, you're not getting what you're worth. Uh, I see that you're the most emotional feedback of that trading mechanism, probably what the reward more than the final one. That's just my take on it. You're obviously going to do what you think is best, but I would more prefer the market do the work for me, where I know, you know 20 out of the last 20 years, 30 out of the last 30 years, the old crop, new crop spread behaved in a certain way. Why? Well, because you have decades and decades, if not centuries, of, of fundamental economic data that go into how the market work, for example, if you do it that way, or the soybean complex. And numbers don't really don't move that much year over year, even decade after decade, because we're we're kind of uh looking at how it all works from a from from an overall economy standpoint. Um, and there's that. So here is another very popular, I'm not in this one, but it is one that typically works out where you are involved in the October, you know, December spread in natural gas, uh, where you're not getting month over month, but you've got a couple of months in between there. And again, you can buy and hold it. Um, um, and this worked Michael, quite handsomely. If I, if I could interrupt for just a second, I'm just going to sure. get feedback from some of the listeners, and it's a little bit hard to hear you, and I think it may be uh, a technical issue perhaps, and um, possibly if we could get you just to call back in, everybody will be able to hear you a little bit better because you're breaking up sort of consistently. And, okay. Um, just want folks to be able to hear you. And if you're going to drop off for a second, I'm just going to explain. Michael has also done a previous webinar with CQG, which is um, recorded and is available on the CQG website. The webinar is referred as CQG's Trading Commodity Spreads in Volatile Markets, and that was done by Michael in 2011. So we hope to have Michael back with us in just a moment. And if uh, I could thank you all for your uh, patience, certainly uh, what Michael has to say is interesting. We just want to be able to hear him a little clearer, and we hope to have him back with us in just a sec. So thank you kindly for your patience, and let's wait for Michael to come back in after he dials back into the webinar. Thanks. And while we'll wait in just another moment for Michael to join us, just uh, if anybody has any questions, of course, about CQG, CQG's functionality, or specifically spreading with CQG, charting spreads with CQG, I'd be certainly uh, anxious and interested to entertain any questions regarding our product, the markets, as Michael's speaking about, uh, trading spreads, looking at spreads. Uh, if you're not real familiar with spreading, I could help you certainly with understanding spreads, possibly markets that you may want to look at primarily for trading spreads, and especially our premier product, the CQG Spreader, which is available with the CQG Integrated Clients. It sounds like we may have Michael back with us. Michael? Yep, I'm here. I'm sorry about that, folks. Sometimes the microphone, and if it's too far away, kind and it broke up and it sounds staccato. I'm not sure what the issue was. Is it better now? 
that sounds a little bit better. I'll let you go ahead with the uh, with the presentation. Thank you kindly, Michael. Sure thing. Um, okay, so we're back here looking at this in um, intercommodity spread. Again, we're looking at a difference between here of 26 and 28 cents. You know, that's two cents or two hundred dollars per contract. It's a great way to kind of take the thing out of trading the markets directionally when you can see that you know, from somewhere down here to at least up here, yes, only going up and down in a very choppy manner, but the overall slope of the line here is positive. And so I guess what I'm thinking to myself is let's just say that you got the spread here. You bought, you know, October sold December um, here at 33 cents. Uh, towards December, you know, premium December, and now you're all the way up here, perhaps, obviously down here now, but as the trend continues, you know, you've been able to capture, you know, eight cents in the marketplace by being hedged, and oh, by the way, you're looking at July here, right? So this isn't something that you have to worry about doing. Uh, now, obviously, if you look at the S&P 500 as the Daytona 500, this probably isn't going to work for you uh, in terms of emotional feedback. But I'm coming from the standpoint of trying to make money and let the market do the majority of the work as opposed to me inserting my ego in what I think, you know, in a very fallible way, what the price targets are, right? I mean, I never really work price targets. I let the market tell me when the trend is over, uh, which is mostly discretionary at this stage of the game for me. Um, this trade could go parity, right? It could go to zero, in which case the person who bought and held can catch or could have caught, say, 30 cents in natural gas. That's $3,000 per spread. Just, just think of when the last time you caught that much yourself on either a biased long or a biased short transaction. Again, it might not be your favorite flavor and it might not feel good emotionally. It's just something to consider because it is possible. Um, Here's, here is an inter-commodity spread, and it's one, again, because we took it talking about relative value trades. You know, how does this look as it relates to, you know, the crude market, right? Because now we have Bob gasoline and heating oil, uh, and we're looking at how the two behave themselves uh, over the course of time. You know, right now we're in heat and oil season, but sooner or later, March or so, heating oil is going to go more into storage and gasoline is going to go online as being what's up next out of the marketplace. And so you'll see people change because their needs will change. They won't necessarily start, you know, taking vacations. But you can see this trade right now is trading at, say, 30 cents to the heating oil side. It can actually go to 30 cents on the gasoline side. And that's a 60 cent move top to bottom in the this market in this kind of inter commodity spread. Uh, if Emory serves the CME group because these two contracts are very, very hardly correlated, they will give you a ginormous credit on your margin. And uh, they, they speak about it in terms of credits. Um, let me see. Um, so basically, to calculate the margin on your own, you would look up, you know, what's the margin for gas on its own, and then what's the margin for? for heat and oil, you add the two up and then say you take a 98% haircut or you get a 98% credit on that total value and then that's what you put up. The difference being 2%, 2% then is of the total sum is what you would have to put up as margin to hold this position. You know, and again, it's one that can trade and invert um, and be hit. Not without volatility, but it is one way to play the commodity market without having to buy expensive option premium to do bull call spreads or bear put spreads, uh, directionally speaking, or, um, you know, and buy and, buy and hold basically this important, um, this important economic feature in the, in the overall energy market. Another way to trade gold uh, could be the relationship between platinum and gold. Again, going out to next April, as evidenced by the letter J here, in this intercommodity spread. And again, they will give you a, a credit for the margin. It might be, at times, a more conservative way to play gold um, or platinum. You can choose because you can buy or sell it. Um, 
And here we are looking at the month for the CME group where the margins are, are originated. If you go to the site CME group and look for clearing, you click on that and you'll see um, down here where it says inters, intex, and supers, and then intras versus outright margin. So you can further click on these tabs here to find the data and you, you, you choose the commodities exchange, the COMEX, you'll choose the metals complex and lo and behold one of the first ones that comes up is what are the inter-commodity spreads um, with gold and lo and behold it's the two times platinum times the one time uh, gold market and you know you can put all that math together and they will give you a 70 percent credit for the three different margins that you would have to add up um, to post in terms of maintaining you know that position and that that can mean a lot for emerging CTA because you know the margin balances uh, you have you know things known as capital efficiency and you have to be able to manage your margin uh, appropriately as well as try to trade um, the contracts and make money. So that is all I have to talk about. In terms of the um, the gold, you're looking at about 7,400 bucks. Memory serves maybe a little more. The platinum's almost three grand. And so if you add that all up, you're looking at over $13,000 in, in margin if you were to trade all of the contracts, you know, together. But they give you 70% credit against that. And so if you take 70% um, or just decrease the total margin by 70%, that's how much you'll eventually have to put up to control those positions in your, um, you know, portfolios. And again, you know, you're hedged. Um, here's the calculation. So in other words, the initial margin, uh, you'll have one contract of the gold you're trading to the platinum with half the size of the gold. Uh, so when you add up twice this, you know, plus this, you have that. And then you take this haircut. So for the three contracts, you're just over $4,000 in terms of the deposit for the initial margin to control that spread. Um, so again, you can do a lot of tactical planning when you look at this for your overall book of business. Um, and you know, I'm excited about that. I think it's, uh, these are pretty interesting times. They're very interesting, uh, very interesting ways. I, I like spreads uh, myself. I trade them and hold them. I also, you know, trade, I, I'm con I, I would consider myself more of a position trader. I'm not afraid to buy out in the deferred months so that I can buy outright trades and kind of hold them that way so I don't even have to worry about rolling them or perhaps having, you know, that naughty thing called first notice come up against me um, because there is an expense and there's a bit of a tricky thing happening when you have to roll your contracts from one expiration to the next. Um, you know, but nonetheless, that's how it works for me. If you have any questions, you can fire them away. You can email me, and I'd be happy to uh, at least point you in the right direction. Thank you kindly, Michael. We certainly appreciate your time. Certainly appreciate your insights. And um, Got a couple of questions uh, looks, looks uh, like uh, that just come in. One is from Kelly. Kelly's asking that regarding the new ownership of the KC Wheat contract by the CME Group. Word on the street is that a market will be offered in the implied spread between the Chicago and KC Wheat contracts. In your opinion, how do you think this is going to roll out? And then she, uh, or he, rather adds to uh, ask, you know, how it may be impacting CQG spreader, and I can certainly talk about CQG spreader, but just wondering, you know, in regards to the KC wheat and the changes um, in the recent news regarding that product, what's your feel on that, Michael? You know, I saw the news about, you know, the markets merging, but um, the question is over my head. I have no idea what you mean, because you, you could trade the Kansas City contract against the Board of Trade contract before the merger. If there was some technical change to the contract, I'm ignorant as to what that change is. I think one of the uh, one of the sort of angles that the question may be um, approaching is 
there is the opportunity to spread the KC contract against the Chicago contract. But, and again, this is not something that I know of uh, for sure that's happening, but the concern is, is that the CME group may make a uh, contract that is a Chicago KC spread in its own product. And what I've seen happen in other commodities, you can think of the treasury space where they've brought on the calendar spread essentially. Perhaps they'll make a, uh, a reduced tick um, spread for the KC against Chicago wheat, which will essentially open up more trading opportunities for folks who spread KC against Chicago. That's just a hope. I think on the fear side is that the uh, exchange-based spread will take away the opportunity to leg in and out of those two contracts, but I don't think that would be because we have still an opportunity in the legs and taking lagging risk, which should provide some short-term reward for those that are willing to take it. On a longer-term trading perspective, it may be more advantageous for some folks to execute in what some folks are, uh, are suggesting might be a product that will be a exchange-based spread because it may offer lower costs, and if you're not time-sensitive, it may be a better avenue for you to pursue. So that's Kelly's, pro um, Kelly's question coming in, and that uh, looks like it is it for now in regards to the questions. Of course, if there are any other questions going forward, Michael would be happy to answer them. He's available at editor at martinchronicle.com. In regards to CQG spread or other CQG-related questions, I'd always be happy to answer those. Again, my name's Kevin. I'm the CQG product specialist here in Chicago. I cover the spreader product, and I can always be reached at Kevin F, K-E-V-I-N-F, at CQG.com. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, and thank you kindly, Michael, for joining us today. Thank you.